Hey, welcome back to the channel. Hello. Today we are going to take a tour of the New Bedford Whaling Museum. As you can see right behind me, it is located in New Bedford, Mass. And so come on along. Welcome to our third in our series of Winter Getaways for Boaters. Don't forget to check out our first trip to the Mystic Aquarium and then our trip to the New Hampshire Boating Museum. You'll find links to both of those videos in the comment section below. And if you like this content, please don't forget to subscribe, share, and hit the um, bell so you're notified when more content comes out. The New Bedford Whaling Museum, which is located in the historic district of New Bedford, Massachusetts, focuses on New Bedford's most famous industry, which was whaling, back in the late 8th, 19th century and early 20th century. However, it also focuses on the city itself, highlighting some of its other industries, including textiles and mechanical uh, manufacturing. This display shows how whales get caught up in fishing nets and how harmful it is to the whale. The museum does an excellent job of highlighting the attributes of the city of New Bedford. It also does an excellent presentation of the whaling industry without glorifying it. model of a classic whaling ship here. You can see the whale boats hung out on davits on the side that would be launched to pursue the whales and once they had caught a whale the whale would be towed back to the mothership for processing. New Bedford became a whaling capital after Nantucket and in fact at one point surpassed Nantucket because one of the advantages of New Bedford is, unlike Nantucket, once the whales and whale product was brought ashore, it could then be shipped throughout the country. And in fact, it was shipped overseas, where anything coming into Nantucket then had to be processed first and transferred to the mainland before it could then be um, commercialized. As whales became scarcer and scarcer, the whaling fleet was forced to pursue whales not only in the Atlantic but into the Pacific and then north into the Bering Sea. They would pursue them so far north they would get into the ice flows and it was not uncommon for whaling ships to be icebound or even lost as the winter came and they were trapped in the ice flow. One of the highlights of the Whaling Museum are its numerous paintings depicting goings-on in the late 19th century, not only whaling activities, but life in general.
it. This statement says it all. It exemplifies the attitude of the early colonists and the Puritans of how the natural resources of the earth were there for the taking and the fact that they fished and hunted and lumbered many things to extinction was not even a consideration for them. Samples of walking sticks made from whalebone. The New Medford Whaling Museum highlights not only the, the city's history of whaling, but also its commercial growth, including transportation, and the mill wheels that sprung up as the whaling industry started to die down, it was replaced by the manufacture of textiles. And in fact, many early whaling businessmen got into textiles as um, petroleum-based products replaced whale products. Although, as many of us have read, the mills were equally as exploitive, however, they were exploitive of human capital rather than whales. People toiling for hours a day at low wages to produce textiles. A sample of the many products over the years that have been made in New Bedford. As you can see from this map of the United States, the products made and developed in New Bedford were shipped nationwide, across the country, down south, both by rail and by ship around the world. The city of New Bedford represents an important component of New England's industrial development. tell the scale model of a whaling ship probably about half scale but you can see the whale bows hanging on davits the fake gun ports painted on the side which were a an effort to keep pirates and others away but they're in fact not gun ports In fact, here is a sample of a whale boat. You can see how narrow and thin they were, but they were very fast when you rode them and very maneuverable, although very easily tossed around.
ship's wheel. And here is the brass binnacle that would have contained the compass to guide the ship. This particular one came from the Bark Josephine from 1887. It actually has a Ritchie compass. For those of you who are familiar with compasses, Ritchie still makes compasses today. These are samples of harpoon tips. go aboard this replica of a whale ship you can see just how everything was laid out the rigging these were square rig ships and this area right here would have been known as the triworks. Basically a large wood-fired furnace on board to turn the whale into whale oil. In hindsight, whaling was a fairly brutal activity, but at the time, the Puritans saw it as their right and a way of life and the demand for the whale oil as for lamps was seen as justification for what they did. As many of us know today, many species of whales have been hunted to almost extinction and there are far fewer of them today. We're thankful that this activity no longer continues except for in very extreme situations. A few countries do permit, permit some whaling and native populations still whale, but they whale on, they take one or two per year, not on a commercial or large scale basis. The whale was then, whale oil was then stored in kegs in the hold of the ship. A typical voyage lasting upwards of a year or more until the hold was filled. Samples of knots that sailors made to pass the time because a whale passage or a whaling trip could be punctuated by hours if not days of nothing, doing nothing and so sailors had to keep themselves occupied and making handicraft out of rope was one of the ways they did that. The pay for a typical sailor on a whale ship was calculated by a percentage of the total profit from the ship. So when the ship returned to shore, all of its costs were subtracted from the sale of its, of its cargo, and then whatever was left was divvied up amongst the crew. But a typical crew would get something like a one one hundredth share of the profit, so for a year, time at sea you could be paid $150 maybe $200 where the captain and the first mate would often be paid several thousand dollars for the same trip but as they say it was a living and for those who sought to see the world and your alternative at that time was farming or some other type of labor work.
So I think we're going to wrap this video up here. I hope you enjoyed our midwinter trip to the New Bedford Willing Museum and join us for the next trip. See you next time.